host of international stars come together at the Playhouse Theatre Edinburgh for a royal gala performance. Good evening from Edinburgh, this stately, royal and ancient city that will host the 13th celebration of the Games of the Commonwealth next year. And where tonight, stars of stage and sport have gathered to play their part in a royal gala performance in the presence of Her Majesty the Queen. by His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh, Chairman of the Games Federation since 1955. And greeted by the Lord Provost of Edinburgh, Right Honourable Dr John Mackay and Mrs Mackay. Also in the Royal Party, the Royal Highness Princess Anne, the Queen, whose message at the opening ceremony is carried at each celebration by a torch relay it has been a feature of the game since 1958. Mr. Kenneth Borthwick presented, chairman of the organizing committee for next year, and Mr. Len Young, who's chairman of the game's appeal. Mr. Watson Peat, the BBC's national governor for Scotland. This is Watson Peat. Alastair Milne, Director General of the BBC, and Mrs. Milne. Bill Cotton, the BBC's managing director. Michael Gray, controller of BBC One, and Pat Chalmers and his wife, Pat, the controller of BBC Scotland. Paul Delfont, chairman of the London Committee of the Gala Performance. Mrs. Borthwick. Waiting to present uh, bouquets to uh, Bangladesh cousins at school in Edinburgh. That's Jolie with one for the Queen and Reaper with a bouquet for Princess Anne. <laughs> and as the royal party make their way to the royal box, the fanfare sounds in the theatre, sounded by trumpeters of the Royal Marines.
Your Majesty, Your Royal Highnesses, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, most heartily, welcome to the Playhouse. When the 1970 Commonwealth Games came to the heart of Scotland, the whole of Scotland took them to its heart. So warm was the welcome that even today they are thought and spoken of as the friendly games. And it is our hope tonight that something of that warmth and informality has been captured in tonight's performance. So to start the ball rolling, here are the Paddy Stone dancers with their own particular version of the world of athletics.
Ladies and gentlemen, Bob Monkhouse. What a real thrill it is to be here. 39 years in show business and here I am. Opening comic on a one night stand. <laughs> but it's been a wonderful week. This is the climax of a great week in Edinburgh. Only spoiled, I think, every morning by the, by the morning papers. I mean, it's been the same every day this week. Who wants to look at Arthur Scargill's face over a plate of hot porridge? <laughs> I'd rather look at a plate of hot porridge over Arthur Scargill's face. <laughs> I saw the headline yesterday, Scargill attacks Thatcher. I knew that man would go for his hairdresser one of these days. <laughs> it's not been a good week for Mrs. Thatcher either, with the Brecon and Random by-election and uh, the trouble with the common market. Oh, she's been a little irascible. Have you noticed that? A little bad temper. I think it's something they call PMT, Prime Ministerial Tension. <laughs> I'm not sure. One, two, three, four, one, two, and you smile, I can see just what you had for tea, but your smile is the key to my heart. And the heart is beating tonight, the heart of Scotland, and I see you looking well, and I'm glad. And you should look well. After all, Scotland is the healthiest nation in the world. <laughs> well, it has to be. Why else would they be closing down all your hospitals? And the air, the air, when you go to Caithness, ah, uh, and up to, through Sutherland, went up to Cape Wrath, there's nothing there in Cape Wrath, nothing there. Bleak, deserted, not a soul. I swear I saw Lord Lucan. Lord Lucan was somewhere in the distance. <laughs> Passed briefly, riding Shergar. Then back to the hurly-burly of Edinburgh. Oh, the shopping in Edinburgh is great. There's a new range of toys in the shops, I noticed here, from Hong Kong, educational toys. And these toys are, are meant to prepare kids for what happens after they leave school. None of them work. <laughs> There's no hotels in the world like you can find in Edinburgh now. I'm in a wonderful hotel. Uh, they put me in a suite uh, with mirrors on every surface, uh, it's called the Narcissus Suite, and, uh, <laughs> and there's mirrors on the walls. There's a mirror on the ceiling, on the ceiling. And I didn't see the mirror on the ceiling till this morning. I, I woke up, I'd kicked all the sheets off. I don't wear pajamas in bed. I'm just lying there, spread eagle, and I opened my eyes, and I saw the mirror. Well, I screamed. <laughs> I thought a naked skydiver was jumping on me. <laughs> A very old, naked skydiver. <laughs> I got over the shock. I was late. I had to rush here through the traffic here. A nightmare. And I got outside the theatre, and I did something I'm ashamed of. I feel guilty. I saw a teenager stealing a car, and I did nothing to stop him. <laughs> I was so glad to get the parking space. <laughs> I came rushing in here. They rushed me into makeup, which I hate. I said to the makeup girl, I hope you're not going to make me look like Boy George. Ha, 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 ha. And she said, you'll be lucky if you look like Lloyd George. Oh. <laughs> I was here, you know. I, was, I topped the bill here a quarter of a century ago, and I was such a smash. Here I am again. And <laughs> I recognized the place. I went in the bar. It was very crowded about uh, half an hour ago, but you could still see all the guilt and the plush. And I said to the, the woman working behind the counter, I said, you know, it's 25 years since I first came in here. She said, I've only the one pair of hands. You wait your turn. <laughs> well, these little things are sent to try us. You take the pins from new shirts. You miss that one pin that hurts. That's when you've got a smile. Smile, smile. You grind out your cigarette. You've not put your shoes on yet. That's the time you've got to smile. Smile, smile. Spray your armpits with that can from the shelf. Then you walk like this because you've lacquered yourself. Now it's time for you to grin. It's the best way to win and make this night worthwhile. I'll be the illustrious names here for the Commonwealth game. I hear to make you smile, yeah. Smile. Freed 
for the evening from the commentary box, David Cope. Uh, tonight, it's my privilege to introduce some of the famous sportsmen and women who've come from all over the world to support this game's appeal. First, one of Scotland's favourite sons, Olympic sprint champion and Commonwealth champion, Alan Wells. <laughs> Three times the motor racing champion of the world, Jackie Stewart. From boxing, the Olympic, European and Empire champion, Dick McTaggart. <laughs> From the track, world record holder and Olympic champion, David Henry. <laughs> From swimming, another world record holder and Olympic champion, David Wilkie. Also from the pool, triple gold medalist in the last Commonwealth Games, June Croft. And now from boxing, the world flyweight champion in 1966 and 67, Walter McGowan. And now the ex-professional world middleweight champion, Terry Downs. <laughs> also from boxing and for two years, the world lightweight champion, Jim Watt. From rugby, twice scorer of 100 points on Lions Tours, Bob Hiller. From karate, the triple world champion, Jeff Thompson. From rugby, one of Scotland's most capped players, Andy Irvin. the track, the Olympic gold medalist and world record holder, Steve Ovet. <laughs> from rugby for 12 years, and from Wales as well, of course, for 12 years, an international player, Gerald Davis. Next, the Olympic javelin champion, Tessa Sanders. <laughs> From cricket, one of the outstanding batsmen, Colin Cowdery. <laughs> From the uh, modern pentathlon, a champion of the world, Kathy Taylor. <laughs> and now from boxing, the 1970 Commonwealth Games middleweight champion, later professional champion of the world, John Conte. <laughs> from the track, the Commonwealth and European champion, and also world record holder, Brendan Foster. from soccer, the man who got a hat-trick in the World Cup final, Geoffrey Hurst.
uh, from boxing for two years, the world lightweight champion, Ken Buchanan. <laughs> from diving four times, a Commonwealth Games gold medalist, Chris Snow. Uh, from Ireland, Ireland's top scoring rugby union player, Ollie Campbell. <laughs> and now from Jamaica, six times a Commonwealth Games gold medalist and of course an Olympic champion, Don Quarry. From skiing, one of our top internationals of all time, Conrad Bartelski. <laughs> and now one of the greatest halfbacks ever to play for Wales, Barry John. <laughs> Next, the captain of England, of Liverpool and of Question of Sport, Evelyn Hughes. <laughs> well now, one of Scotland's most famous, favourite and most capped international soccer players, Dennis Law. Well, now from Scotland as well, Britain's youngest ever Olympic track finalist, Lindsay MacDonald. <laughs> from swimming, the 1980 Olympic champion, Duncan Goodhue. And finally, and we save them till last, two of the great little men in sport in this country today. The champion jockey, Steve Cawthon, and the featherweight champion of the world, Barry McGuigan. Your Majesty, Your Royal Highnesses, ladies and gentlemen, tonight you've seen just some of the famous sportsmen and women, the champions from all over the world who are here to support the Games fight. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't tell you how happy I am to be here on this distinguished evening for this worthwhile cause, especially since I almost didn't get here. Because you see, a lady came up to me and she said, you know, we are having a gala in Scotland, which I think would need the presence of a man carrying the name of Kirk Douglas. <laughs> then, then she looked at me as if she were surprised that I wasn't wearing kilts. And she said to me, I understand that your ancestors come from the Douglas clan in Scotland. And I said, no, ma'am, my ancestors come from the Danielovich clan in Russia. <laughs> <clears throat> now, this rather startled her, so I didn't want her to rescind her invitation, so I quickly told her that I really had a very deep 
warm feeling for Scotland because many, many years ago, I had a very dear friend of mine, Bill Henderson from Glasgow. And we would talk together many times and he'd tell me about Bonnie Scotland and the Bonnie Lasses. And he told me about the deep affection that existed between Edinburgh and Glasgow. <laughs> and of course, we didn't have much money in those days, so we'd get together on a Saturday night and have a couple of beers. And he taught me an old Glasgow song that we used to sing together. And I made a solemn promise that one day I'd sing that song in Scotland. <laughs> now, the lady looked at me and she said, uh, Mr. Daniel Love, uh, Mr. Douglas. She said, uh, she was still smiling, but it was a rather a frozen smile. She says, I didn't know you could sing. And I says, no, no, I can't sing, ma'am. Now she looked at me, no smile. And she said, Mr. Douglas, do you realize that talented artists will be performing before Her Majesty the Queen? Do you realize that this gala will be televised by BBC and that millions of people will be watching? Do you think they want to see a man in Edinburgh singing a Glasgow song who can't sing? <laughs> Well, she had a point. So I had to be very diplomatic. And I say, listen, madam, why don't we treat my little participation as if it were a commercial on a television show? And then while I'm singing, the viewers could go to the kitchen and get a glass of water, <laughs> drink a beer, or whatever. Well, she finally acquiesced, or perhaps she gave up. And so here I am. And I'm grateful to all of you for allowing me, with your indulgence, to fulfill a promise that I made to Bill, Bill Henderson of Glasgow, many, many years ago. <laughs> I belong to Glasgow, <laughs> dear old Glasgow tune. What's the matter with Gleska, for it's turning run and run. <laughs> I'm just a simple young working chap, as only in here can see. <laughs> but when I get a glass or two on a Saturday, Gleska belongs to me. <laughs> call with the latest news headlines. <laughs> and following his shock defeat in the Wimbledon singles, John McEnroe today went out buying presents, apparently spending his earnings hand over fist. Not bothering with the shopping list, he merely went round the store muttering one for Tatum, two for Tatum, three for Tatum, four. <laughs> A report on that follows in part two. In the Soviet Union, officials reacted with disappointment to the news that Andrei Gromyko had been appointed new president, as no one in Moscow even realized he was ill. <laughs> A report on that follows in part two. Now the important part of the news, we go over to Lords and join Richie Benno. Yes, uh, good evening, Sandy. And what a marvellous day's cricket has been out there today. And uh, how good it is to see, how good for me, to see England back in their old losing streak again. <laughs> All the more so after that uh, amazing tour of India and the Far East last year. The most ambitious tour indeed ever undertaken by an England cricket side. India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Australia, New Zealand. And the rest is geography. <laughs> What a fabulous lineup they have as well. A lot of world class players in that England side. Great batsmen like Ian Botham. Great bowlers like Ian Botham. <laughs> Great fielders like Ian Botham. 
and what a marvellous captain they have too in, uh, you know, that friend of Ian Botham's. <laughs> And what a good captain's decision that was to send in the two night watchmen, I thought, and uh, bring the total up. They, in fact, doubled the overnight score for England, bring the total up by lunch to two. <laughs> what a marvellous recovery that was. Now let's go and have a tea time summary on the game from Brian Johnson. Yes, thank you, Roger. Richard. We're having a lovely time here. It's a lovely, typical English summer's day uh, out there. At least I think it is, because we're still sheltering from the raid inside the refreshment tent. Uh, and as you draw us here, it's Mrs. Tomlinson now. Uh, she's opening with a new pot, uh, pouring from the pavilion end, in fact. Uh, she's got two fine legs, three slips, uh, and a frilly petticoat for extra cover. Uh, it's very jolly. And she comes in now, right arm over, splashes it down the offside. Richie's back on the defensive, onto the back foot, and uh, just managed to get the strain at third in time. Uh, jolly well played. And no, he's out, he's out. Uh, there's a catch there. Ian Botham's catch. Dave Definitely taking the biscuit there. Uh, it's a nice biscuit, it's got some jam and uh, it is linseed oil in it. You know, a lovely piece of cricket. And let's now go and have a comment on the rest of the day's play from John Arbutt. Yes, well, <laughs> thank you very much indeed, Brian. And you know, the way Gooch is bowling out there today, you'd think the bat was a protected species. <laughs> I dare say. I dare say if those bales were made of hay, he'd still miss them. <laughs> Mind you, I blame the groundsman myself for mowing the wicket with a... No, I won't say it. Yes, I will, with a, a horse and plough, just one of the English entries in the Monaco Grand Prix. <laughs> no, and there is Emerson Pitty Poldy in the works Ferrari at an incredible speed of what? Behind him is Nigel Mansell in the supercharged Datsun. And behind them is KK Rosberg. And there is Mark Thatcher in the undercharged Sinclair C5. <laughs> and nothing, nothing can start him now. Nothing at all. And here's another. Yes, the unmistakable sound of Nicky Lauder. Uh, I, think, I think you've got it wrong, actually, uh, Murray. It is, in fact, uh, Peter Alice. James Hunt is right. I am wrong. It is, of course, Peter Alice. Uh, no, well, yeah, how about that, sir? Yeah. <laughs> well, 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 well. <laughs> Softly, softly, catchy monkey, up over the top, and, oh, yes, that's got the bag over his shoulder. <laughs> now let's get it onto the green, and now from the royal and ancient, let's go over and join the royal and youthful. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Yeah, it's marvellous to assist in this um, gala for the games, because at the moment, uh, my children are playing exactly the same games as one used to play as a child. You know? Like, um, sticking the stickers on the back of the state Landau, saying, my other car's a Range Rover. <laughs> and, um, playing games like, I'm the king of the castle. Uh, get down, you sun photographer. It's <laughs> uh, But um, being, uh, being almost vegetarian is very difficult. It restricts one's choice of sport, uh, things that one can bring home from the pot, as it were. So I, I, I don't like to tell Diana they're, they're clay pigeons I take home. <laughs> it's very funny watching her try to cook them. They, they, they taste jolly good, actually. Better than those ruddy lentils. Anyway, I think I'll... Uh, <laughs> I feel quite picky, so I'll, I'll nip off and have one now and uh, see you later on. Thank you very much indeed. Good night. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, another guest from Hollywood, Mr. George Siegel.
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be here in Edinburgh on this auspicious occasion. And I've brought a friend to help me entertain. This is a banjo. This is the only indigenous American musical instrument. And I'd like to show you what this thing can do. This is Irving Berlin's Alexander's Ragtime Band. Oh, my honey, oh, my honey, better hurry and let us be and her. Ain't you coming, ain't you coming to the leader man, ragged meter man. Oh, my honey, oh, my honey, ain't you coming to Alexander's grandstand, brass band. Ain't you coming along? Let's be and uh, ain't you coming, ain't you coming to the leader man, rag and meter man. Oh, my honey, oh, my honey, ain't you coming to Alexander's grand stand, grand stand. a real musician, Jacques Lucier.
is bad. The Argentinians have declared war on Ireland. <laughs> They've taken the key of the top of the corned beef tins. <laughs> there were two Ranger supporters fighting outside. I said, what are you fighting for, lads? You're both Ranger supporters. One of them said, he's trying to put a season ticket in my pocket. What did you think of Kirk Douglas singing I Belong to Glasgow? If, if Van Gogh had a heard that, he'd have cut his other ear off. <laughs> it's, the way, it's the way I tell him, isn't it? I'm too good for this dump, you know. <laughs> I played here 25 years ago, actually. It was a Christmas. There's only one man at the show. It was freezing cold. I said, thank you very much, sir, for coming along to see the show. We're going to do the whole show through just for you. He said, that's terrific. Would you hurry up? I have to lock up. <laughs> I'm down at Ilfracum for the summer. The weather's dreadful. The tide didn't come in. It come down. <laughs> that's a cracker. <laughs> there was a German walking along the beach, and the beach was empty. He said, where are all the people? There is no fun about. The beach is empty. Where are all the people? He was a German with a Belfast accent. <laughs> well, there was a wee pig walking along the beach. He didn't like pigs. And he kicked the sand up in the pigs. He said, Swan! <laughs> where are all the people? And the pig said, Said, we have ways of making you pork. <laughs> Do you know Chinese women never have a headache? 
That's why there's a thousand million of them. <laughs> there's a fellow in the bar, he says to me, have a look at this. He said, that's a Japanese hearing aid. It's mechanically perfect. See the Japanese? They are so far ahead of us technically, we'll never catch them up. That is the world's greatest hearing aid. I says, was it expensive? He says, 20 past seven. <laughs> exclusive club in Johannesburg where they play dominoes and the spots on the dominoes are real diamonds and there was an Irishman playing there one night and he stole a double blank <laughs> there was a fella stopped me outside there he says quick where's the nearest police station I said what's wrong he said three fellas have just mugged me with a bag of spuds I said would you know them again would you know them again he said yeah they were King Edwards <laughs> Well, I stood in the queue for the cinema. That film is on. I'm sure you've seen it. Jaws. There was an Irishman in front of me at the pay box, and he asked for a seat in the shallow end. <laughs> well, I had a lovely seat up the front. This fellow comes up. He says, uh, move over. I said, move over what? I paid £5.50 for the seat. It's up the front where I can see everything and hear everything, and I'm not getting out of the seat for you or anybody else. He said, well, that's all right. When the organ comes up, you play it. <laughs> Murphy walks into the scrapyard, he said, would you have a door for a 30 hundred van? I said, I have. I said, how much are they? I said, they're five pound. He said, but they're only three pound in that scrapyard down the road. I said, why didn't you buy one there? He said, I had none. <laughs> he said, well, when we have none, ours is three pound. <laughs> he said, fair enough. I'll come back when you have none. <laughs> Thank you. Frank Carson. Wonderful. We have a saying in show business that uh, there's a difference between Frank Carson and the M1. <laughs> you can turn off the M1. <laughs> That's a cracker. You know. There's great excitement backstage among our international cast. It seems everybody in the world wants to come to Scotland, and who can blame them? Because where else would you want to live? Italy? Who'd want to live in Italy? I mean, the crime rate in Venice is frightening. It's not safe to swim the streets at night, you know. Then. <laughs> you can be riding along in your gondola, and some noisy Burke coming the other way nicks your cornetto. <laughs> Somebody mentioned the Arab states. Well, they do everything the wrong way around in the Arab states, you know. First they commit adultery, and then they get stoned. We do it the other way around. <laughs> Yes. They have the whip round after they've had the drinks. And even... <laughs> even if you speak the same language, you don't use it the same way. I mean, take Southern Ireland, for example. I mean, I was in the... Uh, I was in Cork. It's beautiful in Cork. It's even better in plastic. And I was at the uh, Cork Hilton, and uh, the porter said, Do you want a room with a bar or a room with a shower? I said, what's the difference? He said, with a shower, you have to stand up. <laughs> And Scotland, God love it, it welcomes all the Americans, and that shows the generosity that Scots people when you consider what the Americans do to our mutual language. I mean, uh, Americans, they, uh, they never have anything made to measure, they have it customized. You know, they never have the houses broken into, they have them burglarized. They don't have their initials put on their luggage, they have it personalized. I once told an American friend of mine, my wife was expecting, he said, really, when will she be hospitalized? I said, not for nine months, she's only just been fertilized. <laughs> But we have a beautiful American who uh, really makes our mutual language look inadequately verbalized. Because to see her is to be energized and revitalized. From Las Vegas, Broadway, and the West End, here to the Edinburgh Playhouse, we welcome America's first lady of song and dance, Juliet Prowse.
Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Actually, you know, the first show I did when I came to England uh, as an American was when I, it was a wonderful show back in 1968. It was a Bob Fosse classic, and uh, it was called Sweet Charity. I don't know, did anyone by any chance? Yes? Yeah, okay, terrific. Well, what I would like to do for you is an excerpt from Sweet Charity. To those of you who never saw the show, let me just very briefly explain that Charity Hope Valentine is a dance hall hostess. <laughs> That's putting it very loosely. <laughs> One day she happens to be walking home after work and she bumps into a famous Italian movie star named Vittorio Vidal. He takes her to his apartment where he whines and dines her and of course she is beside herself, which is her favorite position in life anyway. But while she's there, she realizes but if she returns to the dance hall the following day and tells her girlfriends about this episode, there's absolutely no way that they will ever believe her because she's always fabricating stories. So she realizes that she has to get some piece of evidence, something that is absolutely foolproof, so that when she shows it to her girlfriends, they'll realize that this actually did happen and she didn't make up this whole story. So with your permission, this is where this little souvenir scene takes place. Hey. Hey, listen, Mr. Vidal, hey, do you think that I could have a personally autographed picture, huh? Just so I could prove it to myself tomorrow morning that I really was here. <laughs> it's the least I can do, huh? Oh, great. <laughs> you want to do with a mustache or without? Oh, oh, without, yeah. <laughs> For charity. For a charity. Yeah, listen, who was with me in my apartment tonight? Alone, I swear it. Signed, Vittorio. Yeah, yeah, I know the rest, huh? Oh, yeah. Hey, Gola. Oh, thanks. Oh, boy, what a night for me. Champagne, dancing, a personally autographed picture. Oh. Oh. It may not be enough. For a while. Oh, well, to prove to my girlfriends that I really was here. Oh, Mr. Vidal, hey. Do you think that I could have a small article of personal apparel? Yeah, you know, like a, a tie, a handkerchief, an old camel's hair coat, anything. I'm going to get you something right now. Oh. You won't leave. Hurricane Hazel could strike, I'm not moving. <laughs> They could see me now, that little gang of five. I'm eating fancy chow and drinking fancy wine. I'd like to stumble bums to see for a fact the kind of first rate top draw chums I attract. All I can say is, well, we look at where I am. Tonight I landed, pow, right in a pot of jam. What a setup, holy cow, they'd never believe it. My friends could see me now. A million dollar lips. Oh. It's yours. Oh. oh, what a beautiful black thing. Come oh, no, on, it's a hand. Hey, Gola. Wait, wait, there's more.
the snake and dollar chicken coop. I hear those three sharp cats say, brother, get her. Three ton of bed spread made from three kinds of fur. All I can say is, well, wait till the riff and rap. See just exactly how he signed his autograph. What a build up. Holy cow, they'd never believe it if my friends could see me. <laughs> I'm gonna use a dance into the dancing spa. It's a yours. I couldn't. You must. I can't. I insist. I'll take it. Ah, wait, wait, there's more. Ciao, Vittorio, baby! <laughs> if they could see me now, alone with Mr. Pete, who's waiting on me like he was a big tragedy, I hear my body saying, crazy what did tonight she's living like. To think the highest brow, which I must say is he, could pick the lowest brow, which there's no doubt is me. What a step up, holy cow, they'd never believe it if my friends could see me now. Thank you, bless you, good evening, and can I say a very special good evening right at the beginning to all the ladies in the audience. Good evening, ladies. Yay. Listen to those voices, men. Where could we go in the world to find ladies as wonderful as these? Isn't that true, chaps? <laughs> One or two don't know. The, the ladies of Britain, the wonderful people, I'm not saying it because they're here, because we have the best wives in the world. Isn't that true, gentlemen? Yes, yes indeed. The wives of Britain are the people who wake you up at half two in the morning with a dig in the ribs and say, I can't sleep, can you? <laughs> and you come back with that brilliant answer. Huh? <laughs> there's noises downstairs, there's a burglar. Get up and sort him out. I don't think I'll bother. <laughs> when I married you, I thought you were brave. So did everybody else. This is what fools foreigners. You see, I feel sorry for foreign visitors to Britain because they don't quite cope, do they, with the speed that we can think of. Take the, the two fellas who were laying paving stones in the street, you see, and a car stops and a big American tourist, 48 cameras, round his head. So what are you guys doing? They said, uh, we're flagging. For the corporation, flagging. We put the flags down, flag, sand, flag. He said, I suppose that's interesting work. He said, personally, I'm at NASA, state, uh, sp uh, space station, and of course, in my job, we've got to work to the nearest thousandth of an inch. This fellow said, oh, well, that's no good to us, you see, because we've got to be spot on. But... <laughs> it's the problem foreigners have. 
particularly the common market. Take the French and the Italians and the Spanish. Do you know those poor people spend years of their lives learning English? Then they come here and find we don't speak it. <laughs> because we don't need to. We have a common language which is absolute rubbish. Have you listened to the way we talk? Two fellas in a bar. One said, uh, don't turn round, but look who's behind you. <laughs> what chances has a Spaniard got with that? Two old ladies on the bus, one said, Hello, Mary, how's your new teeth? Mary said, I'm leaving them out till I get used to them. <laughs> but here's a cracker. I'll bet you this has happened to everybody here. Tell me if I'm wrong. You're in a bar, you're on a train, you're in a cafe, you're on a deck chair at the beach, but wherever you are, you're sitting down, and next to you is an empty seat. And a fella comes up, and what does he say? Anyone sitting there? <laughs> and you look. <laughs> you do look. And what do you say? I don't think so. <laughs> but why? Why don't you and I speak English? I reckon it's because when we were small, nobody spoke it to us. I mean, you listen to parents in Britain talking to children. Shut your mouth and eat your food. <laughs> you fall off that wall and break your legs, don't come running to me. <laughs> but what I love most of all about you and I is we are funny without thinking. You take the postman who got the envelope. Photographs do not bend. He said, don't they? <laughs> And if we look at ourselves, we don't really need jokes in Britain. We've only got to watch other people. My favourite story, and this is absolutely true, happened to a gentleman and some friends in Great Yarmouth. Now, as you know, Great Yarmouth is the East Coast, North Sea. December time, the North Sea can be a bit like this. And this gentleman and four friends have been for a few pints, Sunday dinner, you see, and they come out of the pub, a bit bulletproof, and one of them said, uh, why don't we get a boat and go deep sea fishing? And the other four brains of Britain said, uh, yeah, we'll do that. And they get this eight-foot motorboat, and they go out two miles off Yarmouth Head in waves like this, fishing. And this gentleman suddenly feels the effect, and he takes very suddenly not well. And he leaned over the side of the boat, and his false teeth fell in the sea. And he shouted something like, you know, how very unfortunate. <laughs> or words of that ilk. And whatever shall I do? For a joke, a fellow at the front of the boat took his own teeth out, tied them to the fishing line, and said, you're all right, Percy, I've got them. And Percy grabbed the teeth, he said, they're not mine, and threw them in the sea as well. <laughs> Folks, you know, one of the most important things in life is time. And on this very special evening, I'd like to thank you for giving me a little bit of your time. Good night, I'll see you soon. Actually, I'm seeing you a little sooner than you thought, because right now, I'm sure you agree, we're all very proud of Britain and its achievements. And it's always nice to find praise of Britain elsewhere in the world. And I was delighted to read that the New York Times actually had a front-page story saying that Britain has taken over from Broadway the mantle of the home of the musical theatre. And surely a lot of the credit for that must go to the hard work and the genius of one particular man. He's a mystery cat, he's called the Hidden Paw For he's a master criminal who can defy the law He's the battlement of Scotland Yard, the flying squad's despair For when you reach the scene of crime, McCavity's not up there! McCavity's a ginger cat, he's very tall and thin You'd know him if you saw him, for his eyes are sunken in. His brow is deeply lined in thought, his head is highly domed. 
His coat is dusty from neglect. His whiskers are on cold. He sways his head from side to side with movements like a snake. And when you think he's half asleep, he's always wide awake. Mechality, mechality, there's no one like mechality. He's broken every human law. He breaks the law of gravity. His powers of levitation would make a big yes there. For when you reach the scene of crime, McCavity's not there. He's outwardly respectable. I know, he cheats at cards. And his footprints are not found in any files of Scotland Yard. And when the largest looted, for the funeral case is rightful. Or when the milk is missing, or another pig's been stifled. Or the three-car gas broke on, and the traps past repair. There's the wonder of the thing, McCavity's not there. Discovered McCavity, 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 yeah. When a crime's discovered, McCavity's not there. things that I seem to get and let myself in for these days. Um, one of the reasons why our musical theatre has taken off in this country is to do with the superb young artists we've got. And I must say thank you to Femi Taylor, a current cat. <laughs> and uh, to uh, a distinguished ex-cat, now in Starlight Express, Kim Leeson.
That was very delightful, but the purpose of this sequence was to play music by myself. And it was also to uh, honor the Commonwealth Games, and that was by Gounod, who was a Frenchman. Oh, well, I'm very sorry. Um, would you compromise a little and sing something of mine if it was in Latin? Of course, yes. Um, ladies and gentlemen, from my Requiem Mass, uh, the Pia Jesu, Paul Miles Kingston. Unbelievers, electricity is wrong. Steam has got the power that will pull us along. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. The inside might 
Gentlemen, Lon Satin from Starlight Express. Um, every now and again, something happens which is very extraordinary in one's career, and it happened to me last week, and that was to hear a song that I've heard many times sung by many world famous artists, and I never thought that I'd hear an interpretation that added a totally new dimension to the song, and also I think even may possibly exceed the Barbara Streisand performance of it. The song, of course, is Memory. The performer who I want to introduce you tonight is Alad Jones. Thank you. 
sunlight through the trees in summer, endless masquerading. Like a flower as the dawn is breaking, the memory is minutes after the news, part two of this royal gala performance in aid of the 13th Commonwealth Games Appeal Fund continues with even more variety, comedy, international stars and a surprise guest. The grand finale to this royal gala performance in 15 minutes after the news here on BBC One.
ladies and gentlemen from Dynasty, Linda Evans. Thank you, thank you, friends of the Jimmy Young Fan Club. Good to be here. I think we probably could, should have left there, Chris, while we're ahead. Uh, anyway, I've, I've been deputised to welcome you to what um, we Irish call Glasgow. <laughs> what, um, now, what, what you Americans call Edinburgh. Anyway, you are welcome. Are you enjoying your stay? Goodness, I'm having a wonderful time. It's a beautiful city. Yes. You're supposed to be quite a guy. <laughs> yes. You should, you should see me when I'm rested. <laughs> Could one person live up to all those stories I've heard? No, no, no. And I don't live up to any of them, I promise you. Oh. But we're delighted to see you here, and I'm particularly delighted to meet you. Unfortunately, we can't drag you down to London to have you on my show, but this was the, the best opportunity I got to talk to you. Now. They've sent me out here because you said that you weren't sure what you wanted to do, and I'm not sure what I'm doing, and <laughs> I, thought that, I thought that perhaps we could huddle, huddle together for warmth. <laughs> and anyway... I heard you like memes. Yes, yes, I, I do. I have two of my own, <laughs> and I, I've brought them up as one who's loved them. I'm just... I was able to put my arms around there and touch the old shoulder pads there. <laughs> It's just that... This it, isn't shoulder pads. That's you? Yes. My goodness. I work out with weights. John Forsyth said that to me. <laughs> he said, well, first of all, he said that I could, half, I could have half of Denver Carrington and your left shoulder pad if I would lose to him at tennis. And I am here to claim my award. No, did you beat him? No, unfortunately, he bet me in those strange little spindly legs of his. You know, he's quite good, isn't he? Are they his own legs? Wonderful? Of course they're his own <laughs> legs. <laughs> of course they are. We've heard terrible rumours about the shooting, haven't we? Yes. The, the shooting, you see. You're not which, supposed to know we, about we the haven't shooting. Se no, we haven't seen it yet, but the shooting. And, and we'd heard that you'd all got shot at the wedding. And I'm out to, more or less as I did for Diane Carroll, to check you for bullet holes. <laughs> and, but I must say, they've done a splendid job on you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. They didn't get you at all. They, they missed you. Did they? Or just we a are flash not supposed wound? to know. Actually, you're supposed to tune in in September and find out. You'll have to wait a year from September, but mm. uh, we're not going to tell. I are should... you kidding? I wasn't. I just found out today that you were going to be here, and the people I was in the room, in the dressing room, with asked me, and I wasn't allowed to say. Mm. Well, I'm sure you were disappointed. Can you imagine how they feel? They, <laughs> <laughs> they were expecting a star. And I, I'm the surprise guest. How awful, how awful for you. Aren't you supposed to be working right now? I mean, isn't this impossible for you to be here? Yes, well, some people find it impossible that I'm working at all, to be honest, most of the time. But no, we, we, we did um, cheat a little bit. But I was going to ask you whether you and Alexis, who are terrific rivals, whether... In fact, there's any rivalry in reality between you and John Collins. You want to know the truth? The, give, us a, give us the truth, Ellie. We can take it, can't we? Yes, come on, Crystal. I steal her shoulder pads. <laughs> she hates me. <laughs> is, there, is there any kind of rivalry over the frocks? No, just I mean, the husband. Just, just the husband. Just the the dresses this. come and go, but we both want Blake. Yeah. He's what? the only thing worth having. Yeah. Nolan Miller gives us all our clothes. Yeah. Do you get to keep the clothes afterwards? Yes, isn't it wonderful? I'm oh, so absolutely. spoiled, I adore it. I don't know what I'm going to do after we're through with the show. You're the only person, apart from, from two people in the hall at the moment, I know. <laughs> you live in a bigger house than anybody else. <laughs> do you, does, that, does, that kind of, does that kind of style appeal to you at all? I mean, would you like to live in a house that big? Yes, I would like to live in a house that big. 
Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, well... <laughs> I can't really afford you on my salary, regardless of what the newspaper says. Yeah. Don't you think it would be nice, though, for dynasty sometimes, if instead of... It seems that when you, whenever you come down those long, that long sweeping staircase, you're always dressed to get dressed. You know, wouldn't it be nice if some breakfast time you came down in a grubby old dressing gown and... <laughs> and old Blake came down in the baggy pajamas and... Fat down like that, and said, you know, looking like a scruff, and wouldn't it be more human if you did that? It would that? be more human, but even John Forsythe at five in the morning comes in looking that wonderful. It's the truth. But to keep the outside fit, what, what do you do? Work out with weights. Yeah? Mm-hmm. You don't play tennis or golf or a slightly more ladylike thing. Working out with weights, I mean, apart from the shoulders, it must... Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I won't... Inv- no, no, please. <laughs> I'm afraid, oh yeah, yeah. I'm afraid I'd suffer in comparison. Excuse me. But we're, we're delighted to see you. I think everybody in Scotland and Britain joins me in greeting Thank you. you. I want to tell you what a pleasure you. it is for me to be here and a part of this evening. It's wonderful to be here in Scotland. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank Linda. You. from North America, Mr. Robert Goulet. They say a law was made a distant moon ago here. July and August cannot be too hot. And there's a legal limit to the snow here in Camelot. The winter is forbidden till December. That exits March the 2nd on the docks. By order, summer lingers through September in Camelot. Camelot, Camelot. I know it sounds a bit bizarre, but in Camelot, Camelot, that's how conditions are. Bowl till after sundown By eight the morning fog must disappear In short, there's simply not A more congenial spot For happy ever after Than here in Camelot Now in Camelot King Arthur got along fine with all of his subjects. He loved them and they loved him, and this went on for many, many years. They had one problem. He had no heir. He had no one to take over should something happen to him. And they were all very concerned about this. One afternoon when the king was walking through the park, Saturday afternoon, no security. Thousands of his people gathered around him, cornered him, and said, Your Majesty, let's move it. Let's do something about this. And he said, Okay, okay. He walked through them, went back up to the castle, went into the kitchen, started chewing on a carrot, thinking to himself, all right, Your Majesty, let's move it. Let's do something, do what? I don't know women, I don't, I, I don't understand them. Merlin, Merlin, come here. You're the wisest man in the realm, help me out. As a little boy, I, I, I played marbles with other little boys. As a young man, I jousted with other young men. I don't know women. I can't handle that sort of thing. And Merlin looked at him and he said, Arthur, Arthur, sit down and listen. How to handle a woman. There's a way, said a wise old man, way known to Every woman since the whole rigmarole began. Do I flatter her? I begged him answer. Do I threaten or cajole or plead? Do I brood or play the gay romancer? Said he smiling, no. No, indeed. How 
to handle a woman. Mark me well, I will tell you, sir, the way. Merlin's advice. That next Saturday afternoon, he attended a polo gala. He met Guinevere. They fell in love, became engaged. The night before the wedding was dusk. He stepped out onto his balcony. All of his people going from their places of work to their homes, and he felt they were all stopping en route to have one last look at their bachelor king, and he said, I know. I know what my people are thinking tonight as home through the shadows they wander. Everyone smiling in secret delight, they stare at the castle and ponder. I wonder what the king is doing tonight. What merriment is the king pursuing tonight? The candles at the court, they never burn this bright. I wonder what the king is up to tonight. How goes the final hour as he sees the bridal bower being legally and regally prepared? But I'll tell you what the king is doing tonight. He's scared. He's scared. You mean that a king fought a dragon, whacked him in two, and fixed his wagon, goes to be wed in terror and distress? Yes. A warrior who's so calm in battle, even his armor doesn't rattle, faces a woman petrified with fright? Right. You mean that appalling clamoring that sounds like a blacksmith hammering is merely the banging of his royal knees? Please. You wonder what the king is wishing tonight. He's wishing he were in Scotland fishing tonight. What occupies his time while waiting for the bride? He's searching high and low for some place to hide. And though the expectation, the divine anticipation, he must feel about the wedding night to come. But I'll tell you what the king is feeling tonight. He's numb, he shakes, he quails, he quakes. And that's what the king is doing. The snow may never slush upon the hillside. By eight, the morning fog must disappear. Don't let it be forgot that once there was a spot for one brief shining moment that was known as Camelot, you have made this brief evening a pleasure for me, an honor, and it shall be a marvelous shining page in my memory book until we meet again. If ever I would leave you, it would be in summer. Seeing you in summer, I never would go. Your hair streaked with sunlight. Your face with a luster that puts gold to shame. But if I'd ever leave you, how could it be in autumn? How I'd leave in autumn? I never would know. I've seen how you sparkle when fall nips the air. I know you in autumn. And I must be there. And could I leave you running merrily through the snow? Or on a wintry evening when you catch the fire's glow? If ever I would leave you, how 
could it be in springtime? Knowing how in spring I'm bewitched by you so. A tremendous singer. Wouldn't you agree, ladies and gentlemen? A beautiful singer. <laughs> what a lot of people don't know, of course, is that I, in my time, was a singer. I'm better now. But I used to play guitar and sing, and that's when I first realised how funny audiences can be. I was working in a club one night, truly, and there was a comedian on before me, and I thought he was pretty funny, but the audience must have heard the jokes, because they sat like that. For four minutes. And he told... And suddenly he mentioned one particular funny line, and from the, the restaurant in the corner of the room came... He said, thank you very much. And the fellow said, I'm just getting the sauce out the bottle, pal. <laughs> so I don't play the guitar and sing anymore, and why should I, when we have Canada's premier guitarist? Ladies and gentlemen, the lovely Leona Boyd.
They're not bad knees, are they? They're not bad knees. Yet I can't get Terry Wogan to touch them. <laughs> or more's the pity, Linda Evans. <laughs> now, I'm proud to be standing here in the BBC Tartan, very small checks, and... <laughs> As I, as I stand here at Sassenach, wearing the Scots national dress, even as I speak, Jimmy Logan is phoning Andy Stewart and saying, are you watching this? And can you believe it? Or will you accept the charges? <laughs> because all around the world, the Scots have a special reputation, not only for tremendous hospitality, but also for thrift. And what's wrong with that? Good husbandry. The feeling that you want good value. That's why Scotsmen traditionally keep their money in their sporrans, so that if they are mugged, they'll get some pleasure out of it. <laughs> and I feel I have a wee drop of Scots blood somewhere in me, but uh, I have a thrifty, a thrifty way with me. I'm careful with my money. I even had mother tattooed across my navel so I wouldn't have to pay for the O. <laughs> And it's through the tattoo on a lassie I knew that I came to know Scotland say grand. She had the lot on her body, from logs to Kakodi, and she gave me the lay of the land. <sighs> I love a lady, a bonny tattooed lady. She's a map of Scotland on her skin. From her hat to her nylon, she has pictures of the highlands. I'll tell you where I've been. She's Kilmarnock on her stomach and she's Clyde upon her side. When she quivers, there are shivers in Dalkeith. She keeps green beneath her armpit to protect it from the rain. And when she sits down, she squashes most of Leith. Upon her shoulders, her Scottish shoulders, there's bits of Inverness and monsters from Loch Ness. But if you're a boulder beneath her shoulder, those are not the hills of home. <laughs> Around her toes, you'll find Montrose and Forfar Breck and Dalrymple. You'll see Dunblane by a varicose vein and Alloa covers a pimple. I said to her, Nelly, was that on your belly a sort of a military do? She looked at me coy and she said, silly boy, that's my Edinburgh tattoo. So you take the left leg, and I'll take the right leg, and I'll be in Balloch Avoy. But if you take the track that leads right to her back, there's the bonny, bonny banks of Loch Lomond. Aye, she is covered in Scotland from head to toe, as any man here could see. But when she's had a couple of drinks on a Saturday, <laughs> Glasgow belongs to me. <laughs> and so to a Welsh lassie who's made all of the United Kingdom proud of her. On such a royal occasion, meet a queen of popular song, Shirley Bassey. If there's a wrong way to do it, a wrong way to play it, nobody does it like me. If there's a wrong way to do it, a right way to screw it up. Nobody does it like me. I got a big loud mouth. I'm always talking much too free. If you go for that manners, better stay away from me. If there's a right way to keep it cool, the worst way to be a fool. Nobody does it like me. I hear a love song or ballad. I toss like a salad. Nobody tosses like me. And when my evenings get tougher, I just take two buffering and drink a hot cup of tea. Last night I met an old acquaintance at a fancy corner pub. He said, come on, let's have some supper. Then he used my diner's club. If there's a wrong way to take a guy, the worst way to make a guy, nobody does it like me. A wrong bell, I ring it. A wrong note, I sing it. No 
nobody does it like me. If there's a problem, I duck it. I don't solve it, I just muck it up. <laughs> nobody does it like me. And though I try to be a lady, I'm no lady, I'm a fraud. And when I talk like I'm a lady, well, I sound like it's a fraud. If there's a wrong way to take a guy, the worst way to get a guy, nobody does it like Find him, someone who turns your heart around, and next thing you know, you're closing down the town. Wake up and it's still with you, even though you left him way across town. You're wondering to yourself, hey, what have I found? But it's true If you get caught between the moon and New York City The best that you can do The best that you can do Is fall in love Hockery does as he pleases All of his life, his master's toys But deep in his heart is just He's just a boy Living his life one day at a time He's showing himself a really good time He's laughing about the way they want him to be When you get caught between the moon and New York City I know it's crazy But it's
There's an old Australian stockman lying, dying. <laughs> really weird audience. This fella's dying, huh? Oh, great. <laughs> He gets himself up onto one elbow, turns to his mates who are gathered round in Kostorfen, <laughs> and he says, Watch me wallabies feed, mate. Watch me wallabies feed. Hey, look, they're a dangerous breed, mate. So watch me wallabies feed. All they get the now time me kangaroo down. Sport time, kangaroo down. For a terrible minute, I was on my own there. <laughs> I tell you what, uh, John, let's try something different. Perhaps a slow bolero rhythm. Yeah, do it. That's good, that's good. in the north of my country, Australia, out in the bush, a thin line of light, a little sliver of light on the horizon preludes the dawn. The eerie, primeval sound of the didgeridoo.
sunrise, bring in the morning, sunrise, bring in the morning, sunrise, bring in the morning, spreading all the light all around. the first light in my country, set off to the east, a little bit south, across a couple of time zones, you come to New Zealand from a little town called Pātia on the west coast of the North Island of New Zealand. Our next artists have travelled 14,000 miles just to be here to entertain you. They are fronted by an inspirational figure, a man called Delvanius Prime. Marvellous name, marvellous man. They combine the traditional with the modern. Would you give them such a lovely welcome here to Scotland? They are the Patea Maori Club.
Wasn't that good? Fantastic. From newfound friends from uh, the Partea Maori Club from New Zealand to a man from Scotland that I've admired for many, many years. Would you welcome him on stage, please? Ian Wallace. <laughs> Your Majesty, Your Royal Highnesses, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege and pleasure to thank you all very warmly for being here tonight and to ask you, quite simply, to continue your help and goodwill in the promotion of next year's Commonwealth Games. And now... And now on behalf of a new generation of sportsmen and sportswomen from far and wide who will come to this city and make many friends, I'm honored to present Edinburgh's salute to the Commonwealth.
singers and our stars scotland's guests from all over the world and here they are